There are so many things that are historically unique about the 2024 presidential election, beginning with the fact that the person who is representing one of the major two, part, two major parties as its nominee did not campaign for that office, did not participate in any debates to express her views, did not sit for any interviews, did not receive even a single vote from her party, nor try to get any vote for it, and yet was just imposed on the party and then the country three months before the election. But another obviously historical fact that people are going to remember for a long time that historians will study is that the other presidential candidate, the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, has been targeted with two quite serious assassination attempts within a period of just two months. Now, the only comparable historical example to that is when the President Gerald Ford, who became president when Richard Nixon resigned, and Gerald Ford, based on an agreement, became president in exchange for pardoning Nixon, two, he had two assassination attempts within a 17-day period, one from a woman who was a part of the Charles Manson cult and the other a woman who was mentally ill. But in those cases, there was no real uh, proximity to Ford. The, the first uh, Charles Manson follower did get kind of close to him, but as soon as she pulled out her gun, which didn't work, the Secret Service was able to apprehend her. But in none of those cases, neither was there any political motivation at all. One was a Charles Manson follower, and the other was simply mentally unstable, and there was no political component to it, not even arguably. In Trump's case, certainly this last shooter had a very clear and strong political ideology and worldview that generated immense animus toward Donald Trump, particularly when it came to Ukraine, but not only. He also had been convinced, like pretty much everyone in the Democratic Party and in the liberal media has been attempting to persuade people to believe for the last eight years that Donald Trump poses an existential threat to democracy. That's something he repeatedly said. And then a week after the presidential debate where there was a strong suggestion from ABC's David Moore that Donald Trump actually didn't even want Ukraine to win, couldn't even say that he wanted Ukraine to win. The primary political priority of the shooter, he goes to a golf course of Donald Trump's and tries to murder him and came pretty close. He was just a few hundred, a few hundred yards away had Trump been able to advance on the golf course just a little bit. He would have had a clean shot at him with an AK-15 and it was really by luck that the Secret Service saw this little part of the weapon sticking out from a bush and then shot at the shooter. He then ran away, picked up his car, got on the highway, and then the police apprehended him. Here from the New York Times in their report this morning, just compiling what was known this morning, Trump safe after what FBI describes as an assassination attempt. Quote, the Federal Bureau of Investigation said it was investigating what appeared to be a second assassination attempt on former President Donald J. Trump. Former President Trump was playing golf on Sunday afternoon in Florida when a Secret Service agent spotted a man with a rifle standing by a chain link fence on the perimeter of the course, law enforcement officials said. The suspected gunman was identified as Ryan Wesley Ralph, 58 of Hawaii, according to a law enforcement official. Mr. Ralph was interviewed by the New York Times in 2023, last year, for an article about Americans volunteering to aid the war effort in Ukraine. Mr. Ralph, who had no military experience, said he had traveled to the country after Russia's invasion in 2022 to recruit Afghan soldiers to fight there. He told the Times he once visited Washington to meet with politicians to strengthen support for Ukraine. Quote, I'm just a U.S. citizen that's helping out, he told the Times. And there's all kinds of evidence that he was, in fact, in Ukraine, including all sorts of photographs that he posted to social media all kinds of people in Ukraine who knew him. And there's no doubt he, was, he went to Ukraine with the explicit attempt of doing everything possible to aid the Ukrainian cause. And he made very clear that his goal was the destruction of all of Russia, the murder of Vladimir Putin, regime change, and basically blowing Russia to little beats and pieces, something he was insisting was our moral obligation to do. Again, aligning himself very closely with not only the Democratic Party, you remember every single member of the Democratic Party has that same view of Ukraine, Every single one of them voted to fuel and fund the war with tens of billions of dollars, in fact, hundreds of billions, who believe it's our moral obligation to do everything possible to fight that war, help that Ukraine fight that war and win, no matter what risks we incur. But he also, as I said, went beyond that and began having serious anti-Trump animus, despite having said he voted for Trump in 2016, something he claimed 
he came to regret very deeply. And by 2022 or 23, he viewed Trump as the gravest threat, which was very clearly at least a factor, a major factor in why he tried to kill him. Now, the first shooter is something we still know very little about. Despite being 20 years old, he had almost no online presence. And yet he got very close to Trump, had Trump in his sights, actually hit Trump with one of his bullets, killed one of the persons attending Trump's rally in Pennsylvania, severely wounded another. And we were told, oh, look, there's no political motive to it. This is just an apolitical owner. And now two months later, someone with a clear political agenda tried to murder Donald Trump. Despite how clear this is, the corporate wing of the media, the, the part that is devoted to the Democratic Party, is trying to run interference to say, oh, it's impossible to decipher this person's political views despite everything I just got saying, done saying. He's just kind of freak, some kind of crazy person who seems to have been all over the map. No, just another second mentally ill person bereft of any real politics. Here from Time Magazine, also today, quote, the suspect arrested in relation to the shooting at Trump's golf course in Florida on Sunday has been identified as Ryan Ruth, a 58-year-old, with unclear political ideology. I just want to let's uh, highlight this part here because I think I've already expressed enough facts that make that remarkably deceitful to say that he has an unclear political ideology. I think they're saying that because he voted for Donald Trump in 2016, but then immediately uh, or shortly thereafter said how much he was disappointed in Trump and regrets having done that. He then at some point supported, supported Tulsi Gabbard, saying she should run on a ticket with Vivek Ramaswamy to defeat Trump. Remember, Tulsi Gabbard was at the time very recently a member of the Democratic Party. She endorsed Bernie Sanders in 2016. She ran for president as a Democrat in 2020. And then when she pulled out of the race, she endorsed Joe Biden over Donald Trump. But if you look at his tweets and everything else he said, including a video he recorded while in Ukraine, it's beyond clear. There's nothing unclear about his political ideology. He's basically a never Trump neocon. He wants to have the U.S. go to war to protect Taiwan against China. He's fanatically supportive of the Democratic policy, the Biden-Harris policy of fueling the war in Ukraine, which a lot of Republicans, the, almost in the entire establishment wing of the Republican Party, also supports. And he, they, it says here he has a history of praising Iran and supporting Ukraine. Iran has been supplying weapons to Russia. He just he wasn't praising Iran. He was asking Iran to help kill Vladimir Putin. That's what he was urging Iran to do. Here is a video that was first published in Newsweek Romania in June of 2022. So just three or four months after Russia massively invaded Ukraine, where he is in Ukraine being interviewed by a Ukrainian who speaks English with a clear Ukrainian accent about why he's in Ukraine and what he's hoping to accomplish. So you are working with the International Legion? Yes. And uh, you are trying to convince people to help, to donate, and to join? Yeah, yeah. Um, my final question is, what would you say to the people in order to convince them to join the International Legion or to donate for it, or to be involved in, a, in the humanitarian aid to Ukraine. Right, right. Uh, it's ex just extremely important, the whole thing. As far as joining the military, you know, yes, if you have some military experience or know people with military experience, encouraging them to come and fight. We have units all over the place. So, you know, there were some leadership issues initially, but we've got so many units available to us, Georgian, Crimean, uh, Ukrainian, Territorial Defense, Foreign Legion. We have, you know, so many paramilitary groups. I can put, I put a 74-year-old Japanese guy in a unit. So, you know, we have girls in units. So we have two, two girls that are in, in the unit up the street. So any gender, any age, any skill level to no skill level. But, yeah, if you, if you want to fight, come here and see me, and, and I'll put you in a unit so you can go fight. But... Regardless of that, we should have thousands upon thousands of people standing here with the Ukrainians. This, this Maiden Square, Independent Square, 
we should have millions of people in this square, filling the square from every country around the world. And why we don't, I don't understand. I'm here every day with all the flags from all the supporting countries, with the memorials for the people that have died. And, you know, I've had several people come, but just a handful, you know. So it's, it's it blows my mind that I'm standing here alone without thousands of people from every country, from Asia, from Africa, from Australia, from from Canada, from everywhere in South America, every every place. I'm, yeah, I'm Europe. Ready. Yeah, yeah, Europe, everywhere. We need everybody here. You know, if you have no skills, just just come. You know, we need to we need to be cheerleaders. Just being here and saying, "Hey, I support the Ukrainians and I support human rights and I support uh, good and 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 generosity and caring and kindness yeah. and altruism." And it's just you know, we we need to show the world that we care, and it's it's, it's essential. You know, if you don't do any work at all, just being here and supporting and, and showing them that, that we care, we care for our fellow human beings is, is, is the most important thing we can do. Now, just to be clear, that video was 10 minutes long. It was very, it went very much in that vein. And I personally look at that and I don't see an insane person. I see somebody who's very genuine, who's very clear headed about what, how he sees the war in Ukraine and how he sees Russia. He repeatedly says he sees it as good versus evil. He has been convinced by the prevailing Western media narrative, by the convinced by the American media narrative that this is a fight of good versus evil, that there's no worse monster, maybe in history, but certainly now than Vladimir Putin, and that people all over the West should be going there and risking their lives and fighting and willing to die, as he said he was, for Ukraine. This is not somebody who's babbling incoherently, who has some kind of set of all sorts of conflicting views out of mental illness. I could show you all 10 minutes, and it was just like that, very coherent, very clear about what he thinks. You, it fits right in. He could, he could go on any MSNBC show or write for any Never Trump neocon site like The Bulwark, founded by Bill Kristol, or The Dispatch, founded by Jonah Goldberg. Any of those sites, he would fit right in. There's apparently one tweet that wasn't completely pro-Israel. He showed a map and he said, I don't understand the historical basis for Israel's claim to this land. It was like a very earnest question. And he even said, maybe they have a historical claim to Judea, which is the term that uh, Israeli militarists use for the West Bank. And he said, I think Israel has a potentially historical claim. So a lot of people turn to say, oh, he's, he's anti-Israel. That means that he's some leftist. He wasn't anti-Israel. He just asked that one question that was, I believe, the only tweet he ever had or any mention he had of that topic, but what clearly is the topic that animates him the most is, is the war in Ukraine, and then eventually became Trump's threat to democracy. Here, I think is one of the most interesting things is, last year, the New York Times considered him sufficiently important in the attempt to create an international volunteer force led by Americans to try and gather people from around the world, encourage them, as Vladimir Zelensky urged people to do at the start of the war, Westerners who support the Ukrainian cause to come to Ukraine and fight. He took that call very seriously. He himself went. And here's the New York Times yesterday recounting their experience with the uh, suspected shooter. The title is, Suspected Gunman Said He Was Willing to Fight and Die in Ukraine. Text in a telephone interview with the New York Times in 2023, when Mr. Routh was in Washington, he spoke with the self-assuredness of a seasoned diplomat who thought his plans to support Ukraine's war effort were sure to succeed. He appeared to have little patience for anyone who got in his way. When an American foreign fighter seemed to talk down to him in a Facebook message he shared with the New York Times, Mr. Ralph said, quote, he needs to be shot. In the interview, Mr. Rao said he was in Washington to meet with the U.S. Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, known as the Helsinki Commission, quote, for two hours to help push for more support for Ukraine. That commission is led by members of Congress and staffed by congressional age, and it is influential on matters of democracy and security and has been very vocal in supporting Ukraine. And here is this committee of bipartisan members of the House, almost all of whom are fanatical supporters of the war in Ukraine, which apparently he, he met with when he went to Washington about these efforts to encourage troops to go to Ukraine. And here you see the chairman of the committee is Congressman is, is Joe Wilson of South Carolina. It has Steve Cohn of Tennessee, who's the ranking member. And then people like Ruben Gallego, who's now running for the Senate in Arizona, 
all of Michael Aller of New York, all these people who are joined, united, vehement supporters of this bipartisan foreign policy that includes supporting Ukraine, but so much else. And then in the Senate, you see the co-chair are Ben Cardin of Maryland and ranking member Roger F. Wicker of Mississippi, Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut, Tim Scott of South Carolina, Gene Shaheen of New Hampshire, all these people who are just Mr. Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island, these are all fanatical supporters of the war in Ukraine and also fanatical supporters of having Americans pay for and fuel and fund Israel's military and all of its wars. They have the same ideology, even though they're part of the technically nominally two different parties. And that's the commission with whom he met. Now, I think that this has always been one of the understated reasons to be so concerned about the war in Ukraine. Historically, when the United States or any Western country floods some war zone with highly sophisticated weaponry, and now we're talking about tanks and fighter jets and long-range ballistic missiles, those always end up somewhere that we then have to go and fight. And beyond where those weapons go, and you're talking about pouring immense amounts of weaponry into the most corrupt country in Europe by far, in the middle of a war zone where nothing is being tracked, where there's hundreds of billions of dollars flowing of American and European money. And beyond the question of where these weapons are going to go, there's, it's attracting a lot, of, a lot of fanatics, a lot of highly violent people. Who, who else would go to Ukraine from the West in order to volunteer to fight on the front lines with Ukraine against the Russian army? Just people who are looking for violence, who are looking for some kind of escape from their lives. Maybe people who get convinced that that's the moral thing to do, but clearly this, this person is, is one of them. And it's completely unsurprising if you've participated at all in the Ukraine-Russia debate or the debate over U.S. policy toward Ukraine. These fanatical supporters of the Ukraine war are among the most extremist people you will ever meet. They're unstable, they're violent. They're just connected into the crudest, most vulgar discourse of war. And when you spend years, and this is also an understated impact of a country going to war, I used to talk about this a lot during the war on terror, when you just spend years demonizing an enemy as Hitler, the Nazis, the pure uh, embodiment of evil, you talk about the need to destroy them and blow them up and bomb them to smithereens and kill that country and destroy their country and the glories of war, and you just keep connecting to that mentality. You're going to come back from a war zone oriented toward violence and extremism. Not everyone, of course. I mean, members of the U.S. military are professionally trained not to be that way, and yet a lot of them come back with all kinds of problems with their mental health as well. It's it's. One of the tragedies of sending people to unnecessary wars, not just that they're killed or, or physically wounded, but their mental health is affected as well. And I would expect a lot more people than just this one who have been so radicalized about the war in Ukraine and talking about weapons and destruction and violence and killing and just watching that every day, let alone ones who go there who are so committed to this uh, ideology that they actually go there. He has nothing to offer. He's a 58-year-old with no military training, but he went and claimed at least that he was a key part of the international volunteer uh, force that was coordinating foreign fighters coming from places like Afghanistan or even the West to help the Ukrainians fight the Americans. There's some indication he may have exaggerated his role, but he was clearly there, enough for the New York Times and other media outlets to have interviewed him about what he was doing in Ukraine and what he was doing back in Washington. Now, the other, I think, darkly hilarious aspect of this attempt to say, oh, we just have no idea what his ideology is. It's so confusing. It's just indiscernible. It's just crazy. Is this tweet from April of 20, April 2022 of this year, where he tweeted directly at POTUS, the president of the United States, who at the time was Joe Biden. And this is what he wrote to Joe Biden, quote, your campaign should be called something like K-A-D-A-F, keep America democratic and free. It's an acronym that rolls off the tongue. We are the cutoff movement. Keep America democratic and free. Trump's slogan, however, should be MASA, M-A-S-A, make Americans slave again, master. And then he said this, which every single liberal, every single Democrat on television with a column that I know has said or written this at some point in the last eight years. Quote, democracy, all caps, 
is on the ballot and we cannot lose, we cannot afford to fail. The world is counting on us to show the way. So what is unclear about this? You tell me, he's begging Joe Biden to win the 2024 election on the ground that Trump wants to make American slaves, whereas Joe Biden and the Democrats want to keep America democratic and free. And he's saying democracy is on the ballot, meaning the only way we can save American democracy is if we vote for Joe Biden or the Democrats and against Donald Trump. The whole world, he said, is counting on us to show the way. Does that sound like an unclear or difficult to decipher political perspective? He wrote a, I guess you could call it a, uh, well, here's, here's another tweet, actually, that, that he wrote, just to give you a sense of the kind of things he was thinking. Right around the same time, April 21st, 2024, just four months ago, and he tweeted this to Elon Musk, where he wrote, quote, I would like to buy a rocket from you. I wish to load it with a warhead for Putin's back Black Sea mansion bunker to send him. Can you give me a price, please? It can be old and used as not returning. So this is the kind of thing that, I mean, there's a little dark humor in that, a little black humor in that, that I can recognize. But when you're, this is what you're thinking about and what you're connecting to, this kind of destructive war-oriented mentality every single day to the point where you get so carried away that you actually volunteer to go to a war zone. It's highly unlikely that you're going to come back at some point violent and unstable. And obviously, that's exactly what we got. It's very unlikely that he's going to be the only person like this spreading out to who knows where with who knows what weapons once this conflict is concluded. In 2023, he wrote a manifesto of sorts that he entitled Unwinnable War by Ryan Ralph. And the subheadline was the fatal flaw of democracy, world abandonment, and the global citizen. Taiwan, Afghanistan, North Korea, World War III, and the end of humanity. This is only four months ago. Quote, why has Putin not been assassinated? The swirling question in every chat around the world as to why Putin has not yet been killed. I have asked many occasions of countless people in Ukraine to cross over into Russia and smuggle ourselves to Moscow to handle the job, but all help, all help, uh, all hell loses its courage and will to make something happen. But all help loses its courage and will to make something happen. The entire world runs and hides in fear of Putin just because he has nuclear weapons. Why has the world been afraid of Russia for the last 100 years or 300 or 1,000 years when we have the power to end it? We must strike first. We must give Ukraine back all of their nuclear warheads that we took away with the only stipulation that they all be used. So not only are we supposed to give Ukraine a whole pile of nuclear weapons, the condition for giving them to that is they must use them all against Russia. Quote, we must instigate this war and push the issue to the end. Sadly, the U.S. and the world has likewise failed Venezuela and Juan Guaido. Yet another neocon view that we should be toppling the government of Venezuela, that Juan Guaido, that person we said, was the legitimate <laughs> president of Venezuela. I remember when Nancy Pelosi led the... Uh, joint uh, session of Congress, and she introduced him as the rightful president of Venezuela, and both parties stood up and applauded for them, even though Juan Guaido has never received a single vote for a president in his life, let alone won an election to become president. We just decreed that the rightful president of Venezuela was Juan Guaido, and this is what he's echoing as well, but he's saying, quote, sadly, the U.S. and the world has likewise failed Venezuela and Juan Guaido, and democracy has dissolved quickly under our watchful eye. We have failed yet again. Furthermore, we have mirrored their devastating events with their own catastrophe on January 6th, perpetrated by Donald Trump and his undemocratic posse. Look at how confused and impossible to decipher his political views are. We have, he says, we have, he writes, we have mirrored their devastating events, Venezuela's, with our own catastrophe on January 6th, perpetrated by Donald Trump and his undemocratic posse. Posse. Everything that he writes, pretty much, would fit very well on the New York Times op-ed page, even more so on MSNBC, more still on one of those new neocon Never Trump sites. I mean, this is pure neocon ideology. We have to go around the world importing democracy, overthrowing governments that we think are undemocratic. And obviously this turned into, as it usually does, a fanatical anti-Trump position since Trump 
has essentially been saying that this is exactly what we shouldn't be doing. We shouldn't be going around the world trying to overthrow governments, install better governments or new governments. We should only fight wars when our national security is at stake. And so if you believe in this neocon worldview, it is going to manifest at some point as fanatical anti-Trumpism, which is why Dick Cheney and Bill Kristol and that whole gang are supporting Kamala Harris. He went on, quote, it seems that the Putin mindset is winning across the globe as even the supporters of Bolsonaro in Brazil behaved like uncivilized brats as well. As the International Legion struggles for the simplest of vehicles to get soldiers at the front line, and Malcolm, meaning Malcolm Nance, the MSNBC analyst or commentator who also made a big showing of himself going to Ukraine, as Malcolm is forced to buy his own computers for HQ and Stu to buy lights and cars and the basic necessities, it makes one wonder where all the US funding is going. I mean, again, you can say whatever you want about him, but the idea that, oh, he has this very confused mental illness that makes it impossible to understand what he's saying, he's very coherent. It's so easily recognizable in that worldview. So easily, it's so easy to identify exactly what it is. He's, he's writing it in very clear terms. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.